So the S in Scratch stands for Spelling Challenge. If your name looks like a typo, scratch it off the list. And this is the number one thing people do. And it's all about, they're desperately trying to get an available domain name. It's so much better to have a name that people can spell with a modifier on the domain name. So for Alexandra, you're very welcome to the Scale X Insider podcast. I am really delighted and thrilled to have you on the show today. Thank you so much, Brendan. It's super exciting to be here. Uh, look, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. We've had great fun off the air. So if we can emit some of that energy and fun to our listeners, uh, this will undoubtedly be a great conversation. We shared with you our vision to inspire, connect, and enable millions of ambitious leaders of small to medium-sized enterprises to scale with purpose. So, Alexandra, I open this question to all of my guests. What does scaling with purpose mean to you? Well, to me, that's a really good question. And to me, what it means is making sure when I grow that I stay authentic to my brand and myself. And I see a lot of things that feel very impersonal when people are, you know, doing these mass emails and all of that. And I never want to be that brand. I always want to feel connected to the people I'm talking to because that's how I started. I started out with my email list where I knew everyone on my email list and I could do personalized emails and I moved past that and it kind of bums me out that I can't personalize the subject line or the text anymore. But I do still try to keep it personal, like I'm talking to somebody one on one. And I think once things start to get really big, then you can lose that. So to me, it's trying to maintain that, you know, and staying on brand for me, which is where I actually know, you know, I feel like I know somebody when I'm talking to them. So identifying somebody by their name is something that you have made an incredible career out of. You've devoted your life to, to names and to, to, to branding. How did you arrive at this point? What compelled you to, to devote your career to this? Well, when I started my career, I, I started very young. I was an advertising copywriter. And every once in a while, I would get thrown a bone and get to name something. And I love naming. And I was really good at it. And <laughs> I've never been shy about saying what I'm good at. But I didn't know that naming was a profession. And when I figured that out, you know, 16 years after I started, then I switched gears and I just told everyone I'm going to be a professional namer. And they're like, you can't, you know, you can't do that. You can't just name things. You can't make a living doing that. And like, I did, you know, I wrote a book on it. I became an authority on it and um, yeah, made a nice life for myself. Yeah, you did this with bells on. I mean, you've been interviewed and spoken across the world on the subject of names. I'm curious as a finance guy, my, my background's in finance, and I can see your face dropping already. Um, but <laughs> no, my... <it's> not. <laughs> no, it's not. No, I like finance. I like... I like money. I my like financial services client. Good. So my my question is around the the actual value in a name. Is is there an ROI in giving this real thought? Yeah, if you think about it, so your name is if you think about your name and how long you've had, think about your own personal name. How long have you had your own personal name? How many times have people used it, said it, spelled it, you know, it, seen it in your entire life? You cannot calculate that. And a brand name is the same way. So, I mean, think of all these brands that have been around for more than 100 years. How many times do people see, say, hear, you know, recommend? So your name is the longest lasting investment that you will ever make in your business. Right. It's going to last. So my business is 19 years old. And I think of all of the employees I've had over 19 years, all of the how many iPhones have I had? How much how many reams of paper have I gone through? Just all how many trees have I killed? How 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 most things you, you cycle through them, you get something new, you get, some, you know, but the name is always there. It is a very long lasting investment. When you 
you know, can you calculate the ROI on a name? Well, when, so the, the easiest way to kind of figure this out is like with the name change, right? But when a name changes, like we just, we have renamed two companies that were both more than a hundred years old. But when those name changes, there's a logo change, there's, you know, PR that goes out, social media, there's a whole bunch of things that go into it. However, the one way that you can calculate an, the ROI on a name is if the name is on a menu. So for instance, a menu of services. So we did this with a very hip hotel in San Francisco a number of years ago called the Hotel Vitali. And they offered, they were very cool and they offered wedding services. But the wedding services had really, they were just really pedestrian names. So, you know, the, you know, the rehearsal dinner, for instance, that, that, that doesn't really, there's no personality to it. So they said, we want personality. And they just had these names listed on a menu of services in a binder. So we changed the rehearsal dinner became uh, meet the parents. The, <laughs> the post-wedding brunch became Bloody Mary. There was a, a shower, like a co-ed shower that became shower together. Um, there was, oh, the post reception bar rental. I mean, like really boring, right? Post, you're like, you know, when you're, when you're doing a wedding, right? You're like bombarded with all of this stuff and all of these decisions. And, you know, maybe the bride is like dragging the groom along and like, uh, but he, so he's like, you know, post reception bar rental, you know, uh, but when they change the name to last call for alcohol, then suddenly that's really fun, right? So we change that. And then, you know, when uh, hotels have a guest rate, they just call it the, the or a, a group rate, they call it the group rate. But we change that name to entourage rate because that's fun, right? So when we, all we did was they changed the names in the binder and their sales went up by 25%. Wow. Wow. So... I'm getting a sense that the names must have personality. They mustn't be overly descriptive and bland, but catchy and give context to what it is that you're, you're offering. Now, I have an insight here because I took your smile and scratch test. <laughs> so before we get into that, because I always love to conduct the podcast, like a little mini masterclass to really give our listeners value so that they can take practical action from our conversations. I'm going to put you on the spot here. Our company's called Simple Scaling. Give me a score for Simple Scaling out of 10. So if 10 is the best name that you can ever have, zero being it's absolute pants, what would you... What would you score yeah. Simple Scaling? Okay, I think Simple Scaling is a good name. It has nice alliteration and it takes, it has a nice juxtaposition because scaling, look, scaling is not a sexy word, although I imagine it appeals to the people that you want it to appeal to. Um, but simple makes something that sounds complicated. It takes the edge off of it and softens it and makes it easier. So for that, it's a great name. Is it, is it the most clever name I've ever heard? No, it's not clever, but it serves its purpose. I mean, but you tell me, how does the name work for you? I really like it. And I get challenged with the word simple and scaling. I like the, and immediately it, it seems to conflict. But people would say to me, well, scaling isn't simple. And I say, well, you're confusing simple with easy. Simple means uncomplicated. And if you Google how to scale a business, it returns almost 2 billion search terms in 0.3 seconds and say, there you go. That's how much noise there is around scaling. We created our ScaleX framework, which defines 10 fundamental truths, 10 principles that are existent in every successful scaling business. So scaling is simple when you apply the principles, but it still requires effort. I like that. So like now I'm going to put you on the spot further and indulge myself here because I got asked this today. Scale X Insider. 
the name of our podcast, which ScaleX is the brand which sits underneath our Simple Scaling Group. So Simple Scaling is the company name, and then we have a series of brands uh, which are ScaleX brands. ScaleX Insider, what do you think? I, I would like your podcast name better if it was Simple Scaling. Right. I because get challenged with this today. X, a scale X, scale X without simple scaling and scale X, I don't know what that means. And then insider feels like something that maybe that would, maybe scale X insider would be a membership group inside of, I'm, I'm not familiar with how your business is organized, but maybe, or maybe that's the name of your newsletter or your blog or, or something where it feels more like you're an insider, but, but that's me. So let's step through then what we want to share with our listeners is the, you know, the, the process, the criteria, the components of a 10 out of 10 name. So I've kind of teased them with the, the smile, uh, litmus test. Can you can you step us through what makes a great name? Okay, so what makes a great name? So you did say smile. Um, so I have a twelve point name evaluation test called the Smile and Scratch Test. It's based on my philosophy that a name should make you smile instead of scratch your head. And smile is an acronym for the five qualities that make a name awesome. Scratch is the flip side. Those are the deal breakers. And when you, it, a name makes you scratch your head, you've got to scratch it off the list. So that's how, that's why it's called Scratch. So smile, the S stands for suggestive and you want your name to suggest a positive brand experience. And that's what simple scaling does, right? Like that's very positive. Like, oh, somebody's gonna be, I know you said it's not easy, it's uncomplicated, I like that. Okay, so um, Amazon suggests something very large. So that's a, that's a good suggestive name. Um, I, I recently was at a very large trade show with 100,000 people and 3,000 booths and I gave awards to the top 10 names of the show. It was a food and beverage show uh, called Expo West. And my favorite name of the show that I gave an award to, a Love Your Name Award, a pink, a big pink heart trophy, uh, was Dopamine. And it's a cookie dough company and it's spelled D-O-U-G-H, Dopamine. And I love it because it's got the pun with dough, but then it's a dope name, but also like, like cookie dough, cookie dough, when you're eating it, it does release <laughs> dopamine, eh? And also, when names make you smile, they release really positive neurotransmitters like dopamine into your brain. So love um, yeah, that. Yeah, love that. Great name? Love it. Name. So name. the name must be suggestive and yeah. uh, suggestive of a positive brand experience. Brilliant. Yeah. Something about your brand. So uh, yeah. So the M stands for memorable. Now, what makes something memorable? Because everyone says, I want a name that people can remember. So what makes something memorable if it's based on something familiar? Like we know dopamine, right? That's what makes the name dopamine easy to remember. Um, a, an example I like is there's a bike lock company. I believe they're international, Kryptonite. And Kryptonite, we all know Kryptonite from Superman, right? So it's a metaphorical name because Kryptonite repelled Superman so kryptonite bike locks, therefore, will repel bike thieves. So that's a name that's memorable. So if something exists in our current knowledge base, it's easier to remember than, than something unfamiliar or random words or letters that we don't have something for our brain to latch on to. Memorable. Okay. The I. I, the... <laughs> The I stands for imagery. And if you can, when you hear a name, when you see a name, if you can picture something in your head, it will make it easier to recall later when you're trying to retrieve that name from your brain's dusty filing cabinet. So, you know, you, you, you might not, you know, a lot of times we'll come in contact with a product, a company, and we don't need that right away. 
but maybe you know six months down the road we're trying to remember it now this is a this is actually really interesting so uh i tell people look don't use your personal name as your brand name because no one it name personal names are hard for people to remember however if you are already using it or maybe you work for a big firm but you want people to have a way to remember you. Maybe you're a real estate agent, an attorney. Um, here's This is what I suggest, have a moniker. So what a moniker is, it's, it's almost like a nickname. So there's a, a cannabis attorney and her name is Lauren Vasquez. And there's a million attorneys, right? And there's, believe it or not, there's a lot of cannabis attorneys too. So you might not need a cannabis attorney right away, but maybe six months from now when your cannabis business is taking off and you you need some legal services, you might not remember Lauren Vasquez, but you will probably remember her moniker, which is the fired up attorney, right? <laughs> and another one that I love, it's a realtor and I, I uh, she's a very, a very bubbly blonde, very self-deprecating. Actually, she's a good friend of Bob Berg, and I know Bob Berg is who recommended me to you. Indeed. Her name is Diana, and she her whole identity is tied up in her former career as a flight attendant. She traveled with Pan Am all over the world, and you know everyone loves travel, right? You're either returning from a trip, planning a trip, reminiscing about a trip, so it's a great conversation starter. So as a real estate agent, she already works for a firm, so she couldn't name her business, but she could give herself a moniker to help people remember her. And I, I gave her the, the moniker of the flighty realtor. <laughs> I I love it. I love it. Um, the, the other challenge with people I feel, in my opinion anyway, when people ask me about naming their company their own personal name, that becomes challenging to scale of your offering services because totally. people want you then. If your name's on the door, your name's enshrined in the brand, people want you. And almost there's a, there's a sense of being shortchanged if you get someone else, like you're, you're not getting the full value of the service. That's in my opinion. So when people ask me about the name, should I call it, you know, should I call my company my name? And I don't, this is just anecdotal. I don't have any evidence for this, but what, what, what is the evidence there other than, you know, is there, is there evidence to suggest that actually companies who don't put their name as their, uh, their personal name as their company name actually do better and and scale more successfully is there any evidence to suggest that i'll, I'll give you a great example um there is a guy named jimmy donaldson and do you know who jimmy donaldson is no okay and i bet your listeners don't think they know who jimmy donaldson is either and if jimmy donaldson was just using his own personal name instead of his moniker I guarantee you he would not be the, you know, multi multi-millionaire that he is today. Jimmy Donaldson is Mr. Beast. Oh wow. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, the the famous YouTuber. Uh, the most yeah. famous YouTuber, the most successful YouTuber he is of all time. The most time. famous and successful YouTuber and he has his brand is so strong and he has so how he's been able to play off of his brand is he has a, a snack food line and it's called Feastables. So Feast, of course, like Mr. Beast, it, it, you know, it's lyrical, it rhymes with it. So that's, so if he was just Jimmy Donaldson, he would not be, he would not be making the bank that he is today. I mean, I'm sure he would still be successful because he's, you know, wildly creative and he's done some amazing things. Now, sometimes using your name, so like Ty Lopez, are you familiar with Ty Lopez? No. He's a, Ty Lopez, he's, I'm sure he's a billionaire. He's a, he's, a, he actually, Mr. Beast was one of his students. Ty teaches people how to make money on the internet. And Ty has a very strong brand behind his name, but he started out a long time ago 
but Ty's still very involved with his company. I'm going up tomorrow to hang out, like hang out with him and a bunch of people in LA. Um, but Ty's still very, very involved in the company and accessible and shows up. And it's not like some companies where you're working with a team member. I mean, it, so yeah, but I know what you mean. You do, People do want to work with you. And it's funny, like with me, for some reason, people always think I'm on a book tour. If they can, if they're not working with me directly or talking to me directly, they think, oh, she must be on a book tour. But yeah, you don't want you try not to use your personal name because you will people will want to work with you directly. You're you're right. They'll feel short change. And also, when you go to sell your company, if you're not going to be involved anymore you're good. It's going to be very difficult. And if you take a, if you, you know, are looking into selling your company, that's something they'll ask you, you know, it's your company named after yourself. So imagery we scored when I did the test, we scored uh, positively on suggestive, simple scaling, positive on memorable, but failed, uh, didn't score well on imagery. So L, L stands for legs. And legs means that your name lends itself to a theme. It's the hardest thing to get in a name, unless you hire us, because we're really <laughs> devoted to coming up with name with le- names with legs. However, um, if you can if you can hit the nail on the head with the, with legs, you are golden. So let me give you an example. I was on a podcast. So there's I was on a podcast a couple of years ago with this guy named Jason Sircone. And he then decided he wanted to do a different podcast. He read my book. He named his company first, Bomb Track Media. And he named it after the song that he loves, Bomb Track. Then he named his podcast, Let's Blow This Up. Let's Blow This Up. See, I'm looking at your face. You're smiling. Let's Blow This Up is by far the best podcast name I have ever heard. I mean, it just sounds exciting, right? Yeah. And I was so psyched to be a guest on his show. And, you know, when you have a podcast, you're trying to attract listeners, but you're also trying to attract guests, especially guests that are in demand. I've been on 100 podcasts. Like you, you know, I don't say yes to everybody, but I'm telling you, someone comes comes to me from Let's Blow This Up, like I cannot wait to be on that show because I want to tell people I was on it. And it, plus it sounds really exciting. So... Jason, um, he calls his podcast studio the bomb shelter. He calls his audience the bomb squad. And he calls himself the bombardier, right? And he's all about explosive growth. I love this. I'm still getting over the shock that uh, and the disappointment that you've been more psyched to, to go on Let's Blow This Up than Scale X Insider. But <laughs> setting that aside, uh, and my ego's, uh, my ego's parked for the moment, that's really, really clever. Uh, and the, yeah, it, uh, already it evokes in me a level of curiosity. I can't wait now to go and Google, uh, let's blow this up and 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 find out a little bit more about who, uh, who this guy is and what he's doing and, and understand uh, what vibe the bomb squad have. So, okay, that legs, that, that makes sense. Can I give one more example? Please, of I'm loving the these. That I usually give. Okay, so there's a woman named Lynette Hoy She's a publicist, but she was using her own name, but she knew her name didn't say anything about that she was a fiery publicist. So uh, we rebranded her Fire Talker PR. Her tagline was hot on the press. She calls herself the fire chief. She works in the firehouse, right? And uh, she has packages like Control Burn and Firestarter. And her theme song, and everyone should have a theme song, hers is Fire by the Ohio Players. So before she does a speaking engagement, she's got that blasting. And you know what? You know when you go to a conference and like there's a speaker and they're like super cheesy, like, okay, okay, everybody stand up and turn to the person next to you. And you're just like, uh, cringe, right? I hate that. It's so forced and like just, uh. 
but Lynette, if, she, if she's cranking up, you know, fire on the stereos, on the speakers, people are already, they're like naturally getting pumped up. You know, you don't have to turn to your neighbor or like, Woo, you know, okay, everybody clap, clap. You're like, uh, you know, so yeah. That's, music is really important. My theme song is Sugar Sugar by the Archies. Brilliant. Um, and I'm trying to think what ours would be now. Uh, that's uh, that's some homework for me. And if you have any ideas, and indeed if the listeners have any ideas about uh, a simple scaling theme song, I'd, I'd be delighted to hear it. Yeah, yeah. Simple. Yeah, I don't know. That's a tough one. I, I, but, but yeah, I don't know. That's a tough one. So we'll come back to that one. There's, there's some homework, Alexandra. The E then and smile. The E stands for emotional and it's really important. You want your name to make an emotional connection or it's going to go right over someone's head. So, you know, I've, I've given you a lot of names today that make you smile, right? And that's a really strong, positive, emotional connection. So let's see. Another one that I love is uh, a frozen yogurt chain that we named Spoon Me. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the power of a name that makes you smile with spoon me people love the name before they try the product and you know what that was like with dopamine i didn't even know what dopamine was i just saw the name and i loved it i was like oh my god i love that name that's like and that's what at this trade show with three thousand booths you know i'm just like scouting the aisles and like if a name grabbed me that was like and I loved it before I even really knew what the product was. I, I might see like, like it was a can of soda or, you know, something like, or coffee, but I might not know enough about it, but like Death Wish Coffee, Death Wish Coffee, they were one of the award winners. There's so much coffee. And I was at, at our grocery store last night and I saw Death Wish on the shelf and I was looking at all the other copies. Death Wish immediately says, this is strong coffee, right? And most coffees don't describe anything about the coffee, but Death Wish does it in such a clever way. And they are so unapologetic about their name. And if you want to follow a great Instagram, Death Wish Coffee is a really good one. Brilliant. I, I love this. And, and what I'm sensing then with, with dopamine already, I'm building a picture in my head of the kind of culture that dopamine have within their company, uh, kind of young, hip, trendy staff, they're wearing t-shirts, they, they greet you with a smile, um, they're having fun with the brand. There's a, you know, before I've even sensed the product, there's a, there's a strong sense of the, of the culture in that name. That name evokes a very, very strong, fun-loving culture. What, to, to, to be a little bit contrarian, so, what would you have said to Ronald McDonald when he approached you way back and said, look, I've got this great idea for a burger chain. I think it will, will go far. I want to call it McDonald's. You know, I'm proud of my surname, um, so, so let's call it McDonald's. What would you have said to him, Alexander, because it doesn't meet any of the, the smile criteria? Yeah, that was a different time. That was a really, really long time ago. McDonald's was innovative in, in the service they provided. And the, you can't do name, like, like, like banks, right? Wells Fargo Bank. The name Wells Fargo, it doesn't say anything about what the bank, it doesn't stand for anything. It's two people's last names. Same with McDonald's. There's no legs there. So yeah, McDonald's has been successful, but if you look at Burger King, they've like really played off the crown. And I was, I named something for Burger King, um, Mac and Cheetos, which are these um, deep fried, like they look like giant Cheetos, but they're filled with Mac and cheese. And I had, uh, I had my social media team over a couple of weekends ago and we wanted to film something about that. And I'm like, oh, I need one of those crowns. And this guy's like, oh, I have one in my car. Like, and they've been using that crown for years and years and years, right? So they've been able to do something with that name. Um, 
Baconator, I name for, for Wendy's. And the Baconator is such a famous name. It has its own Wikipedia page that I did not create. It was recently an answer on Jeopardy, what is the Baconator? And it was also an answer in the New York Times crossword. And there's Sun and Baconator, there's Baconator fries, there's breakfast Baconator. There's so many different, there's Baconator Pringles. There's so many Baconator products. So um, yeah, but Brilliant. McDonald's, Wells Fargo, in, in the Wells Fargo, I, I, I'm, I'm sure they're not in Ireland, but I'm sure you have banks in Ireland that are named after people. And we, I told you we have renamed two companies that are more than 100 years old. And one of them was the First National Bank of Syracuse, which was an award-winning regional bank. Syracuse is a big city in, in New York, but it wasn't in New York. It was in the middle of the country in Kansas. And Syracuse is a tiny little town an hour from the closest airport, which is the tiniest airport I've ever been in in my life. And we, they were all about helping people's dreams come true. So we rebranded them Dream First. And the name Dream First really says something versus a name like, you know, Wells Fargo or First National Bank of Syracuse. That is brilliant. That, that, what a, what a name for, for a bank um, whenever, Actually, the bank can enable people's dreams. So, you know, already it, it there's a sense of you being welcomed in, uh, being greeted by people who are going to support you, who want to know about your dreams and are going to help you get those. That is masterful. I can't move past the... Uh, the the Burger King and it reminds me of a of an advert that Kentucky Fried Chicken ran, which was absolute. Um, it was a it was a branding masterpiece when they ran out of chicken and they played with the KFC, and it was this billboard advertisement that uh, saying we're uh, FCK, we're sorry. <laughs> chicken here and that would have like they the, we're so conservative here in america not me personally but yeah i don't think that would have ever ran it's hilarious fck that. we're sorry so um, that's when 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 people have been clever and, and play with the with the brand names so one other and what i'm hearing is is the fact that well look what was acceptable uh, years ago is no longer acceptable. And I'd like to just poke at that a little bit. But before I do, St Steve Jobs has come, knocked your door, you know, uh, 30 years ago and said, a brilliant, a, a brilliant idea for a company name. And uh, he, he, he sets in front of you an apple and says, there it is. I want to call my company Apple. Doesn't meet any of the smile criteria. Um, would you have thrown him out of the office? I would throw him out of the office, but I would have said, I mean, the, the way I think of things is, could I present that to a client and feel really strongly about it? You know, like a name like Spoon Me. I felt so strongly about that. Um, or Dream First. No, I don't think, I don't think Apple is a particularly creative name. Um, it's a company with a great product, just, or many great products, just like Google. Google is a weird name. I mean, when Google first came out, I'll never forget where I was the first time I heard it and saw it. And I, I thought it sounded very babyish, like goo goo. And, and there's a story of, uh, there was a, when Google first started, they had ads on NPR, our, our you know, pub, public radio, national public radio. And the announcer had to read them live. And the announcer would just cringe every time he had to say the word Google because he felt it was so babyish too. But obviously the name Google has grown on us. We all like it now. But like, they had a phenomenal, they were phenomenal, right? And they still are. So it's okay. I love the name Alphabet. Um, you know, I, I like that they've used the G, Gmail, G Suite, that works. Not everything, not every name they, they do is great. Um, but yeah, Apple, 
No, I, th I think like a name like Dream. That would have been a cool name for Apple, right? Because it's super aspirational. There's nothing aspirational about an Apple. Yeah, yeah, I get it. And it seems to me with the finance brain on again that you would be required, which they, these companies have, to spend a lot of money to actually get that brand on the lips of your customers um, and really give them context for it. Um, so, you know, we've, we now know these brands are synonymous, um, you know, with, uh, with, with, the, with the products that we love, but it's taken a lot of hard yards to get there. What I'm sensing here is, you, you know, if you've got a blank sheet in front of you, don't make it hard for yourself. You know, there's, there's a, there's, there's these, I love this, acronym smile I, that makes sense to me as you're chatting through i've literally smiled for the last 30 minutes as you're speaking through it so you know it's evoking a sense of emotion in me just chatting through this acronym it makes sense there's you know the the triggering dopamine within people triggering oxytocin um uh, getting the, the the endorphins flowing the injustice just a name is very very powerful so where do people get it wrong then when they when when they scratch? Yeah, so many different ways. So the S in scratch stands for spelling challenge. If your name looks like a typo, scratch it off the list. And this is the number one thing people do. And it's all about they're they're desperately trying to get an available domain name. And it's such a mistake. It's so much better to have a name that people can spell with a modifier on the domain name. So for instance, eat my words. If I couldn't get eatmywords.com, which I do have. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to spell words, W-O-R-D-Z. Then forever, I would have to tell people eat my words with a Z. And they'd be like, what do you mean with a Z? The S is a Z. Wait, what? You know, or, or maybe... Maybe, yeah, and then, but it, I see it all the time. People, anytime you have to stop and explain your name to someone, uh, either how to spell it, how to pronounce it, what it means, you're essentially apologizing for it, and that devalues your brand. It's much better to get a domain name where you just tack a word on. We could be, you know, eat my words creative, eat my words branding, eat my words naming. There's so many different ways to do that, um, hello, eat my words. It's so much better to have real words that you don't have to stop and spell for people than having to spell your name. Yeah, again, that's that's genius and so simple. So that's what you term, I've never heard it called this before, but that's what you, you call a modifier. So it's essentially, yeah. it's a prefix or a suffix in right. there that that is suggestive. Yeah, and there's there's so many creative ways around this, the workarounds, um, just to just to divert to domain names for a little bit, because people get really like, they get so, look, do not start your naming search on GoDaddy. That's the last place to look. We never look, we never look at available domain names until the very end. Um, yeah, I was working with a client yesterday and he's like, oh, the domain situation, you know, I can get this for 10 million, 10 million, $10,000. And I'm like, just add, it was a design firm. I'm like, just add the word creative onto it. Like when you have a modifier, it actually helps in with your search engine optimization because it helps Google know what it is that your company does, right? It says more about you. And nobody expects you to have an exact match domain name, but there are ways around, There's, there's you can have fun with it. So we named a a gourmet popcorn store, Pop Psychology. And I could not get that domain name. So we use the tagline, crazy for popcorn. Uh, another one that I love is, well, this is, so if you can have a domain name that makes this like really strong emotional connection. There's a, there was a, uh, there is a condominium tower in San Francisco, luxury condos, and it's called Lumina. And they couldn't get Lumina.com. So their domain name while they were doing this ad campaign was Life at Lumina. 
And to me, that was just like, uh, I would walk by and see the billboard and I would just be like, I want to live there. Like that just sounded like, oh, I want my life at Lumina, right? Another one uh, that I love is, this is a smoked mail order turkey, right? Mail order turkeys. And the company, it's just a family name, Greenberg Smoked Turkeys. Greenberg Smoked Turkeys, not creative. Greenberg can be spelled two different ways. However, their domain name is so creative. It's so unforgettable. And it is gobblegobble.com. <laughs> Oh, that is that is brilliant. Have you ever been stuck? You know, once you I love that 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 that's such practical advice, because I've been guilty of this before of going straight to the domain, and then being disappointed. Uh, and I'd never I hadn't contemplated the the modifier. I think you've liberated lots of people just by by disclosing that. Alexander, that's that, that's just so wonderfully practical. Have you had 100% success rate once you've decided on a name then in terms of actually getting a suitable domain, domain name aligned to that? Yeah, we, we always do. We always do. And if it comes down to, you know, the client's trying to decide between three names and we look at domain names for all of them, I mean, sometimes that's the deciding factor, you know, which has the better domain name associated with it. Yeah, but we've, we've always been able to do that. And there's there's plenty of ways around it. I mean, you know, use a verb. Um, with all of these food and beverage companies that I just gave awards to, like there was one, I love this name, it's Perfy, and it's P-E-R-F-Y, like perfect. And I loved it because it sounded very like something that, you know, Australian Australians and British people are always like shortening words and making cool new words and like perfy. It just sounds like a cool, a much cooler way to say perfect. And it turns out that um, that it's a it's a soda. And the guy was a uh, he was type two diabetic and he was able to reverse it. And he invented this soda that's you know low sugar soda, and he named it perfy. Because that's what he would always tell his mom when he was little. She told him, she, he would say, mom, you're perfy. I'm like, so sweet, right? And I love that it's sweet and it's like a sweet soda without sugar. And he has drinkperfy.com, which is just perfectly fine. Drink perfy. It tells you it's a drink. Yeah. These are brilliant. Brilliant. The C then in scratch. The first C in scratch stands for copycat. Nobody likes a copycat. We learned that in second grade, right? You know, copycat, copycat. <laughs> so why be somebody else when you can be yourself? So do not copy another brand. Um, the one that I, I the, just the most egregious one out there is uh, a frozen yogurt store called Pinkberry. And Pinkberry has been ripped off so many different ways. Blissberry, Yoberry, Youngberry, Coolberry, Moberry. I mean, you name it. It's there's a, a frozen yogurt store with the word berry in it. There's so many. And then even there was a frozen yogurt store called Red Mango, and that was a ripoff. It was a color and a fruit, like pink berry, red mango. So yeah, I mean, I see very deeply into names. I can usually dissect what was going on. <laughs> There's a lot of psychology there involved in all of this. Um, and we'd come to that in just in terms of the, the, the psychology around naming. Mean, you've alluded to it in, in, the, in the context of the E in the SMILE acronym, in terms of the, you know, invoking an emotional response. But so the R in scratch. The R stands for restrictive. And restrictive is when you outgrow your name, right? So there's a store in Canada a big store called Canadian Tire. And people in Canada apparently go there like once a week. One out of, they go there once a week. It's like that popular. But Canadian Tire sells way more than tires. They sell tools and toys and trampolines and trees and tropical plants and lots of things that start with other letters than T. But it, it started out as a tire store 
obviously. And then they kept adding more merchandise. And, you know, I'm sure it's been over a hundred years and they kept the name. And, you know, people in Canada now know they sell way more than tires. But back in the 80s, their tagline was, we sell way more than tires. So obviously they had to get that out there. That's a waste of a tagline. And so, yeah, everyone in Canada now knows who they are. However, what if Canadian Tire wanted to roll into the U.S. or into Ireland? They can't use that name, right? Well, we had the same However, challenge. We, we had the same challenge in our previous business. Alexandra was called CDE Ireland whenever we were a small company. And, you know, we had global aspirations. We had aspirations to export to to many other countries. We did. We exported to more than 100 countries globally. But we changed the name very early on back in 2003. I think it was maybe even 2001 from CDE Ireland to CDE Global so that the context for both people joining um, was very clear so that someone who had aspirations for a career within the company knew immediately that actually there's going to be travel involved here. So if you wanted uh, a nice kind of steady nine to five, it probably wasn't the company for you to be joining or if you didn't like traveling given the, the global aspirations that we had and uh, and similarly for our customers in other in other countries we didn't want to appear small we want to appear much bigger than uh, we wanted a name to match our aspirations at that time so so a personal experience of this one actually in, in terms of changing the name from ireland to global yeah and that was good and that was an easy that was an easy change right yeah yeah, really, yeah. really straightforward. So restrictive, the A. The A in Scratch stands for annoying, and you don't want your name to annoy people. You want it to be frustration-free, friction-free. So an example of a name that would annoy, annoy someone is if it's spelled backwards, right? So there's a company, it's spelled, it was, uh, they're no longer in existence. It was spelled X-O-B-N-I. And no one knew how to pronounce it. No one knew what it was. And it was inbox spelled backwards. But like, how would you know that? And people do not intuitively spell names backwards. Like if right now I said, Brendan, spell your first and last name backwards. It's like you couldn't do it. It's really hard for people. Our brains don't think that way. So yeah, so don't annoy people. Don't be cute. Don't put, let, don't put numbers in your name unless it's, Unless the number makes sense, like there's a, brew, a a brewing company called 21st Amendment, which, you know, we know the 21st Amendment, that makes sense to people. But if your name is Coast to Coast and you have the numeral two in there, you're going to forever have to explain and spell it to people. Their emails are going to get kicked back because they're spelling out two, T-O, not the number two. So, yeah, it, it just take away the friction and frustration. Brilliant. Makes complete sense. The T then and Scratch. The T stands for tame, and you do not want your name to be tame. You cannot be a wallflower. You need a name that's going to stand out and be bold and get noticed. So an example of a super tame name is a domain name registrar, network solutions, which, you know, that combines two of the most boring words in the English language <laughs> into one super tame name. Network solutions. I mean, it's just like... Like, if you're trying to fall asleep at night, just keep saying network solutions, right? <laughs> oh, brilliant. The C. The second C in Scratch stands for curse of knowledge. And that means you know what it means. Maybe your engineers know what it means, but nobody else does. So you kind of forget because you have the curse of knowledge. And a really easy way to remember the curse of knowledge is if something is foreign to someone, it can be a foreign word that they're not familiar with or just something that they're not familiar with. It's foreign, you know, and remember, like with memorable, you want something to be familiar. So, uh, you know, words or like there's one. Um, Yukonuba is a name. Do you have that brand of pet food? It's a brand of pet food here in the States. Um, it has a weird, it's U E U K, I, I don't know, Yukonuba. It took me forever to learn how to pronounce it. Um, 
And it means, I, I had to look up the meaning, and it, it's an old, old term from the 50s jazz era, or maybe the 40s jazz era, and it meant the tops or supreme. But nobody knows that. It has the curse of knowledge. And finally, the H. The H in scratch stands for hard to pronounce. And just like with you, Canuba, you do not want your name to be difficult for people to pronounce. It should be really intuitive. Um, an example I like is uh, there's a company, it's a crafting company, and it's spelled C-R-I-C-U-T. How do you pronounce that? C-R-I-C-U-T. C-R-I-C-U-T. Cry cut. Yeah, that's what I thought, cry cut. And for years I pronounced it cry cut. And then this woman hired me, who is the queen of cry cut and Abby Christian. And then she corrected me and told me it's pronounced cricket. I'm like, what? And she's like, yeah, everyone says it wrong. So here's this brand, right? So if I was getting into crafting and I'm asking people, what's a good craft for me to get into? Something that would, you know, colorful and like keep me busy. And one person told me cry cut and somebody else told me cricket. I would have no idea they were exactly the same thing. Who knew there was as much power in, in a name? You mentioned at the outset and a wonderful rebrand, Dream First. I've been involved in rebrands and, and they're typically quite painful. You know, you're leaving the old, the thing that you've, you've got used to, um, even, though, even though it may not have met the smile criteria when this name was birthed, you, you, it's part of your identity. What would you advise? Because I suspect there's a lot of people listening, you know, everything you've said there in the context of the smile acronym and, and, and why you would scratch it if it didn't meet smile, that's intuitive. That feel, you know, it feels right. There's nothing there that you're suggesting. Well, no, nah, you know, I, I would, I, you know, I would challenge that. There's nothing there that I, I feel that isn't intuitive. How do we best go about the rebranding process to make it successful and and to take people on that journey? That's a great question. The first thing you need to do is just let go. Let go of <laughs> this presentation I do to employees after we change the name of a company just to kind of bring them on board. And I have this guy hugging this giant teddy bear. <laughs> it says let go. You have to let go of the old name. And we just went through this change in the name of this. It was a health, it was a health health service provider, um, a chain of healthcare clinics serving low-income people. It was, and they were named uh they were named Queen's Care and they had been around over a hundred years. And the people, they they were forced to give up their name. And a lot of times people are through legal battle or some kind of, you know, partnership divorce, something like that. They're forced to, you know, trademark infringement. They have to give it up. And they don't want to. You have to just realize you got to let go. And there is a better solution out there. That's just, the I think, the very first important step. And then go through the process like a real you know naming process of you know starting from scratch and just keep have an open mind don't start with the domain name again like that's that's the last place you want to go um so when we were rebranding queen's care um the the name that we came up with and they were really stuck on it they did not want to let it go but the branding, we were working with another branding firm on it, and the guy was like, you have to let it go. So it's good. It was coming from him. And they ended up loving the new name, which is Grace Light. And Grace Light is a really pretty name. It makes a nod to that they're faith-based. And it's just beautiful. Light lends itself to a lot of different imagery and wordplay. Just a beautiful name. So they ended up loving it. So you have to just realize you might love the name. And also names grow on us. We, we changed the name of this women's organization. It was, uh, it was formerly called 
F W E N E, which is like the most clunky acronym, right? Or yeah, acronym, yeah, acronym F W E N E. And it stood for the Forum for Women Entrepreneurs and Executives, you know, just a mile long. And we rebranded them Watermark because it was all about women rising to a higher level, leaving their mark, making an indelible impression. It was a beautiful, pretty name. And they were smart. They formed a small committee for the name change. They decided that was going to be the new name. They announced it to the board. Not everybody loved it, but it, it eventually grew on them. So names do names do grow on people. And now they can't imagine, you know, it's been 15 years. They can't imagine being named anything else. We encourage people as part of our scaling program to embrace the eighth principle of our ScaleX framework, which is place, which is about taking your wonderful product or service beyond your border into, into other territories or into other uh, sectors that they're potentially not selling into at the moment. Is there a clever way of providing, um, you know, some cover for internationalizing here and when you say dream first to me we're you know we're we're sharing names here in the english language you know immediately i get uh, dream first but you know in the us you've got a large let's say you know uh, spanish community where they're having to translate that to get the e in smile to get that emotional connection which isn't um immediately invoked if it's not in their in, in in their language in the in the in the potential customer's language is there anything clever we can do there in the context of internationalizing you know we're crafting these names maybe when we we're a, when we're a small business but the business grows like the example of ireland to global but is there a way that we can mitigate the against the impact of us tripping up in a new market with a name that we've given great thought to, you know, 10 years ago and it met the smile um, criteria? That's tough. I mean, with the type of clever names that we do, it's it's internationally, they don't always work, but most of our clients aren't trying for international. And when somebody is going international, oftentimes they'll just invent a word that is meaningless and so it doesn't mean anything in any language, but I don't know. We When we are going international, we have international linguistic checks run, disaster checks, making sure it doesn't mean anything dirty in French, for instance. Uh, <laughs> that happens a lot less than you would think. I mean, you hear all the horror stories, obviously, but um, yeah, not as common as you would think, but... No, we, and I think people, by the time of brand, most people that come to us from another country want a name that is something that's meaningful in English. You've, um, you've, you've teased me with the, with the words that haven't um, worked in another language. Before we move into our close, um, Give us give give us a funny story about a name that has um, that ha has went wrong whenever whenever people have tried to take it maybe into another market or a, a, or another sector. Well, here's two that went wrong that were just wrong. I mean, one was a an Asian food restaurant that was launched inside of a Whole Foods, and it was named Yellow Fever. And like, it's, it's so wrong. Oh it's goodness. so wrong in a million different ways. It's like a deadly disease. It kills people. It's also super racist term, you know, for people that love, you know, it's like a fetish, like, you know, Asian fetish. Um, so that name was super wrong. And then also here in the States, and they, I believe they, they had like 80 locations and they still kept this name. And here in San Diego, where I grew up, I, I grew up 26 miles from the border of Mexico. And like, this is, it's like the N word for Hispanics and it's Beaner and they were Beaner's coffee. And like, I mean, it would be called like, it would be like calling it the N word coffee. Like, 
no, like, no, 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 right? Like, like calling, like, copying ne Negro, but it was spelled Negro, like, like, it was that bad, Beaner's copy. So they finally, finally changed it. And they knew by then that it was wrong, but they waited too long. And it, it was such an expensive name change. And they changed their name to Big B Coffee, which is, you know, it's not even a good name. And yeah, it was a very expensive name change. But yeah, you got to look, go on the Urban Dictionary. You know, if you're sure, not sure if, if your name means something, it's like a slang word. Urban Dictionary. Um, look, if this, something has like three upvotes, then you don't have to worry about it. But if something has many, many, many upvotes or down or whatever, like, no, take that seriously. Yeah. Before we move into the close, is there any, is there anything that we should be mindful of? Is there anything that we haven't touched upon that you feel is, is critically important, um, especially for SMEs who, and I meet a lot of them through our own community. Companies are typically, you know, the initials of their name, or if there's co-founders, it's the, you know, it's the co-founders initials. Um, you know, what would you say to, to those SMEs who at the moment have aspirations of sc to scale or quite small, um, they have a list of priorities that likely doesn't include a rebrand right now. What would you say to them in the context of their name? Well, if you're a subject matter expert and you're just using your own name, you need a moniker. That's, that's what I would say. So I'll give you, I'll give you another example. This is a, a guy, he was on, he was on, sorry, I have to adjust the way I'm sitting. <laughs> He was on a, a webinar that I did, and he was uh, his name was Bruce Bruce. I can never pronounce his last name, and this is the problem when you have a name that's difficult for people. So Bruce is he is the father of cause marketing, right? So the cause marketing, where whatever marketing you're doing, it's doing some social good, so everyone benefits. And when he said he was the father of cause marketing, some, sometimes things just snap in my head. And I said, you're the cause father, you know, like the godfather. And he just lit up. And he's like, that, the godfather is my favorite movie. I love the cause father. So he had cards made. He dressed in a tuxedo. He had cards made, you know, the cause father. And now he's so memorable as the cause father, right? It's, and he loves to give out his card now. People talk about it. It's easy to remember. So if you're trying to think like, oh yeah, I met this guy who's actually a big cause marketing guy, but you couldn't remember Bruce's name, but you can remember the cause father. Yeah. One of my most fam uh, favorite monikers for a person that, that I uh, have a huge admiration for Wim Hof, which is a fairly standard Dutch name, but his moniker is the Iceman. So a lot of our listeners will be familiar with the Iceman who um, crafted the Wim Hof method, which is focused on cold exposure, uh, breath work and mindset. So um, mm -hmm. a, won a, wonderful, a wonderful moniker, a wonderful man. Um, that seems like a fitting place to, to end after the cause, Father, I love that. Alexandra, we have a closing tradition on the podcast, given the incredible international experience that you've had both within your work and your travel. I know you travel extensively. Can you share with our listeners three timeless takeaways? Sure. I don't think any of these relate to travel. Oh, but <laughs> the first one is... And it's so important. If you are using your own personal name as your brand name, you are missing a tremendous opportunity. Tremendous. So think about Lynette, you know, Fire Talker PR. Think about Jason with, you know, the let's blow this up, you know, bomb squad, bomb shelter. Um, so that's one. Um, two, 
is just remember that your name will last longer and get used more than any other investment you make in your business. Trust me, I know. I've had to eat my words for almost two decades. People have used it so many times. They love it when they see it. That is priceless. And lastly, um, don't start by looking for a domain name. Make the domain name your lowest priority. Oh, sage advice. This has been an absolute masterclass. Alexandra, I have no doubt that people will, will want to find out more. So how best to reach you and find out a little bit more about your work? Um, eatmywords.com is my website and my Instagram is eatmywordsnames plural and yeah on the on the instagram go on my link tree and uh there's a lot of goodies there brilliant well look we'll put a link to that in the show notes um, i'm i'm asking this question and i'm a little bit jealous of the answer because the answer might be um i'm going to go surfing but what's next for you <laughs> Well, what's next? I'm going up to Los Angeles to hang out with Chai Lopez and a group of high net worth individuals. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Which I, I don't know who these people are, but I know they're flying in from all over the world. And like, I'm so lucky I get to drive there in two hours. But yeah, we're going, we're like tomorrow we're meeting like in a canyon to go on a hike or something. And then we're meeting in a park and we're shadowing Chai. So that's going to be really exciting. Um, yeah, so that's what's next for me. Brilliant. And, then, uh, and also our house, which is super fun and bitchin', uh, it's on the Point Loma Garden Walk here in San Diego. And if you guys want to see something really cool, check out our backyard. It has its own Instagram. It's San Diego Bitchin' Backyard, Bitchin' without the G, because we live in the cradle of bitchin' here in San Diego at, in Ocean Beach. But yeah, San Diego Bitchin' Backyard. Welcome to my world. Oh, brilliant. I'm going to go and check that out. Um, Alexandra, it's been an absolute joy to, to spend the last, um, the last 60 minutes with you. I've loved your, your energy and your incredible wisdom. You've given so much value there. I wish you every success in, in educating people about the importance of, of their names and, uh, and I wish you every success with the work that you're doing. So thank you.